Hey guys, Maven here. A few years back, Men's Health put out an article of 30 rules you probably didn't know WWE wrestlers have to follow. Well, I'm a former WWE wrestler, so today I'm gonna read through them and tell you whether they are true, somewhat true, or absolute hogwash. Let's get into it. Number one, no throwing your opponents over the top rope. Years ago, when you would throw someone over the top rope, that was an instant disqualification, meaning the match was over. That rule wasn't always followed because guys would get clothesline, guys would go over the top rope all the time. As wrestling moved towards a television product, bigger was always better. And throwing someone over the top rope just was always a better look aesthetically to the audience. Now, most of the matches that we would put together, we always had an agent. And for instance, Arn Anderson was my agent a lot. And we would put spots together because we had certain time cues that we would have to hit. And if someone was in the ring and needed to get to the floor, an easy way to do that and to sell it as a big move was always a clothesline over the top rope. So I don't want to say that we necessarily needed permission, but most of the time we were getting permission anyway just to make the match, make the move look big. The only thing you didn't want to do, the one thing that you did not want to sell early was a big move if it was going to be used later in the show. During a Raw taping, if I was the first, second, or third match in the night, I wasn't going to do a big move like a clothesline or a throw out to the to the floor because later in the night, I don't want a big move like that to lose its oomph. I want it to mean more later in the show. It wasn't necessarily a don't do. The agents were usually telling us whether we could do it or whether we should just leave it in for one of the later matches. So. Already through number one, men's health, you got that one wrong. Number two, don't speak your mind. <laughs> okay, this one is definitely one that it wasn't a rule per se, but you had to be in the right place to speak your mind, and I never was. <laughs> if they wanted me to do something that I didn't think I could pull off, I would speak my mind. If they maybe wanted me to do a move that I didn't think I could do safely for myself or my competitor, then I would definitely speak my mind. But if I thought my character, if I thought just what I was doing for the night wasn't best for me, I wasn't saying a word. Now, that was me. Take a John Cena, take a Randy Orton. Were they speaking their mind? Absolutely, they most definitely were. When you're one of the top guys in the company, you earned your position and you earned the right because they're making money off you, but most of all, you're making money for yourself. I wish I would have got to that place, just never did. Men's Health, you're probably, I'll give you a good check mark on that one. Number three, and I have no idea where they got this one from. Didn't matter if you're a male or a female, you gotta attend all the shows. Love to, love to know where you got that one, Men's Health. Number four, no low blows most of the time. Low blows, just like earlier, we talked about big moves. Low blows are definitely one of the one of the big moves, and it's not something that's a big, gigantic, or tough move, but it's a move that's going to elicit a crowd reaction. Think of wrestling matches you've seen in the past, and when you see your heel, your bad guy, give a good low blow or a nut shot, the crowd always reacts, and that's because Hey, what we're trying to do, we're trying to act like we're in a real altercation. In 2005, the Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania, Simon Dean and myself had a segment with Steve Austin. And during, during our ruckus, I find myself on the floor and Steve, as he's pulling me up, says, watch the mule kick. He turns and gives me a low blow. And right then, immediately, something as simple as that, the crowd reacted perfectly to. And why? Because they hadn't seen it all night. And the fact that you know, Steve Austin was doing it meant so much more. Also, a low blow would be used when a wrestler is getting heat, meaning when the bad guy, the heel, is taking control of the match over the baby face, the good guy. And when you're a bad guy, you, you want to cheat, you want to poke eyes, you want to pull hair, you want to do anything that can give you the upper hand, give you the advantage. And you want to do it in a, a less than honorable way. 
nothing says that better, nothing tells that story better than a good low blow at the right time. So men's health, good on you, you got that one right. Number five, no blading. And if you're interested in finding out how we blade or gig or get color, check out my video where I talk about the secrets of wrestling and I, I show you exactly how we made our gigs. But if we were going to get color, if we were going to, to bleed, it was definitely something that the agent, something that the office was going to okay and approve approve of ahead of time. Sometimes we get color and bleed the hard way. And by hard way, I mean maybe a chair, maybe we fall. One time I was wrestling The Undertaker for the Hardcore Championship and he hits me over the top of the head with a trash can lid. I wasn't supposed to get color, I wasn't supposed to bleed, but the lid caught me at the top of my head in the right spot. And next thing I know, I'm sitting there bleeding. Obviously, I wasn't gonna get in trouble for this when I got backstage because it wasn't something that I meant to do. Getting color, it's, a, it's, it's big and they don't wanna waste it. They wanna make sure if someone's gonna be out there getting color, it was at the right time at the right show. So good job, Men's Health. You got this one right. Number six, no pile drivers. We all know that Austin hurt his neck on a pile driver. So it was one of the moves that was just phased out from the business because the pop that you'd get from the audience wasn't worth the risk given to the wrestler receiving it. It was never told to me, don't do any pile drivers because it wasn't a move I was gonna do anyway. It was just common knowledge backstage. Just leave it out, not a move, not a move worth doing, not a move you needed to, to put in your arsenal. Well, unless your name was Kane, Undertaker, or, or Lawler. So I'll actually agree with you on this one, men's health. Number seven, get your own car. One of the biggest misconceptions and one of the questions I've answered over and over is how we got from town to town, from show to show. Most people think that the promos, the, you know, you know, jet flying, limousine driving, you know, that you know, Ric Flair from the 1980s when he would cut that promo. Most people think that's actually accurate, and it is not. When we would land in a town, it was our responsibility to rent a car. It was our responsibility from get to town to town. So I'm agreeing with him on this one. We always had to get our own car, but we want to save money, everybody, and we want some company. So guys would always jump in cars and guys would always team up. During my time, I rode, you know, in the beginning of my, my career, I started riding with Al Snow. I then rode with Devon Dudley. And the last person that I routinely rode with was Randy Orton. And on the occasions where we would have to, in the middle of a loop, fly from one town to the next, we were keeping that same, same setup and when we landed in the new town, we would just rent a new car. So I agree with you, men's health. Number seven is accurate. Wrestlers have to get their own car. Number eight, no third party interference. Now what they mean by this is actually physically putting the fans and getting them involved in our matches. And you know what? I know a lot of times you see maybe a cop, maybe a paramedic or someone seems like they are involved in the production. If you see that, know that that is a person. Usually it's a, another wrestler, another worker, maybe an independent wrestler from that area who has been hired for that night to be a part of the show. There is absolutely no stunt grannies that we're incorporating. There is never a time that we're gonna pull an unsuspecting fan and bring them into a, to the show. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't want fan involvement. A lot of times when I was a heel or a bad guy, I would definitely pick out individual fans and I would jaw jack and cut promos on them and have a good time at their expense, but at no part was I going to ever physically involve them. I was never gonna touch them. I was never I was never even gonna get too close to them in any way where they might think it okay to touch me. Remember, we're doing a show, and it's a show where we want everybody to have a good time. I want the fans to have a good time. I want them to feel a part of the show. I wanted them to feel a part of hating me at that moment, but never at the expense of physical altercation with anybody. So, men's health, I agree with you on this one.
Number nine, dress in heels required for female superstars. During my time when I started and I was on the road, there was no dress code. We would show up and they didn't care. And we would fly on planes and I would have cut off shirts on and sweatpants on. A few years into my run with the WWE, they stopped that all together. They made sure that we represented the company and represented the WWE brand as well as we could. It did mean slacks, it did mean button up shirts or polos. They basically, they wanted us to, they wanted us to look presentable. They wanted us to look good when we were representing the company. But at no time, at no time did I ever hear dress and heels required for female wrestlers, I never. Sorry, Men's Health, you missed the mark and you missed it widely on this one. Number 10, zero punching. The fact that a closed fist back in the day could call for an immediate disqualification. They are insinuating that punching was a no-go in our business. But I remember wrestling Ric Flair many times and he would get me in the corner and he would call the spot and his spot was one, two. And what that meant is he would throw a punch, one, and then I would throw a punch back at him, two. And we would do this over and over and it's one of the one of the things the crowd loved, one of the things the crowd would come for. There's a lot of guys that would, punching was a part of their arsenal and it was a part of their arsenal early. William Regal was, was a guy who was who was known for his punches and he, I mean, he would stand and that's how he would, that's how he would stand, that's how he would look menacing across you in the ring because Regal, he's known as a brola and that's just, that's part of his character. Well, sorry, men's health, you missed, missed the mark on this one. Zero punching, no. Punches were always, always a part of the part of our business. We are wrestlers, we are brawlers, we are having a fight per se, and in fights, punches are thrown. Our business is no different. Number 11, no props without approval. You're not going to just grab a trash can lid, grab a chair, grab something without having it pre-approved by your agent. But we're also out there in the spur of the moment and we're reacting and, and you know, for every action Newton says, there is a reaction and sometimes that reaction includes props. Here's an example. When I first started in my career, I was at HWA, the developmental for the WWE Heartland Wrestling Association, and I was wrestling a guy named Just Incredible. Our match spilled out to the outside, and while we were wrestling along the ring apron, Justin reached up and grabbed and hit me with a water bottle. Water went everywhere and it just made for a great visual. Obviously, we had no clue we were gonna get down to the floor and get this water bottle, but did we get in trouble for it backstage? Absolutely not. That doesn't mean you're going to just take it upon yourself to open up and get under and dig out and pull out trash can lids or anything like that never gonna happen. We definitely want to get approval on props, but we don't want to not do something that comes to us if it's gonna make the match better. So you're half right on this one, men's health. Number 12, no social media posts without permission. Well, this is one that my age and the fact that it's been years since I was there, I would believe they don't want you to obviously give away a storyline on your social media feed, but I don't think they mind, or I don't even think they can control someone getting their brand over, or someone getting themselves over in their social, using their social media. I guarantee you, the WWE wants you to become a big name. They want you to become a big name so you help them make more money and bring more eyes and more viewers to their product. Do I think they monitor social media feeds? Probably not. Do I think that they don't want you to post without permission? I think that's a train that's already left the station. I don't think they could stop people from posting and yeah, I don't think they ever will be able to. Men's Health, I'll give you credit for this one being part, part right, but not all the way right. And for number 13, <laughs> oh, get the f out of here. Number 13 is no f 
in cursing. <laughs> and men's health is actually on to something here. A few years back, WWE wanted to become more family friendly and they wanted to target more of a younger demographic. Definitely not from the attitude or the aggression era like I was in. There was a little bit more we could get away with when it came to salty language. The fact that they're targeting more of a younger audience, the fact that so much goes out on these and through feeds, they don't want it to be a, a f fest, for lack of a better word. I don't think that the no cursing is a flat out rule, but I guarantee you that backstage they limit cursing and they do not want you to have a potty mouth. Like, they don't want you out there having a f potty mouth like I got, that's for damn sure. <laughs> And for the next one, number 14, no real names. They assume that when we're in public that we're only using gimmick names. I gotta be perfectly honest with you, there's there's some guys, I'm not even sure what their real government name is. Maven is my real name, my on my birth certificate, ID, my name from birth. Years ago, I was introduced to the Godfather from Al as Papa from his Papa Shango days. I have called him Papa anytime I have seen him for the last 20 some years. If I see him tomorrow, I'm gonna say, hey Papa, and shake his hand. I have no clue what his real name is to this day. Some guys, we do use their real names. Test was an example of this. I remember when Test told me to stop calling him Test and start calling him Andrew. So I would use his real name, but other guys, I, if I see Taker ever again, I'm gonna call him Taker. I'm not gonna call him Mark. Now, if I'm at a, a, a WWE sanctioned event, maybe the SmackDown Your Vote when I did it with JBL, I was not going to yell, hey John, I was gonna, hey JBL. Or if I see Hunter, I'm gonna call him Hunter. I'm not gonna call him Paul. I do understand where they're coming from and I'll agree with them on this one. Real names, leave them out, obviously. Keep, their, keep the anonymity, keep the, keep the gimmick names going. So good one, good one, men's health. Number 15, don't steal moves. You steal someone's move, you're out of here. They're, uh they're actually 100% right on this one, but sometimes guys would, would maybe take a move that had been made popular by someone else, tweak it a little bit, repackage it, call it something different, and make it their own. Now, you run the risk when doing this, and as long as it's no one's finisher, then hey, there's only but so much moves out there. But someone's signature move, someone's finisher, that's not up for discussion. Don't even try it unless you want to find yourself out the door. Men's health, you got this one right. Number 16, no more wrestling after a cut. Now what they're insinuating here is once someone's cut open, once someone's actually bleeding, that, that the match can't continue until it's sealed or until the bleeding stops. Wasn't my experience that once you get color or once you're bleeding, the, any match would, would stop and actually, quite the opposite. You know, if someone is cut open, we want that. That's a good visual. We want to we want to get as much out of that visual as possible. So, I never saw any match be stopped because of blood. In fact, quite the opposite. If someone was bleeding, we were actually going to it to try to make them bleed a little bit more. Now, I do recognize that times are a little bit different than when I was when I was there. And I know that during WrestleMania with Edge and Finn Balor, when, when Finn had a pretty, pretty decent sized cut, they stopped the match for a while and attended to it. They didn't want him fainting. They didn't want him losing too much blood. So I do recognize during my time, anytime we saw blood, that was, that was a happy accident out there. Whereas now, a little bit safer and they attend to them. So, you know, in men's health, I'll, I'll agree with you. You're not right. You're not wrong. You're right down the middle on this one. Number 17, no ropes during entrances. And I'll even read what they say. While this rule is, isn't strictly enforced, it allegedly exists. Unless times have completely changed from, from my time, there's, 
there's no rule that exists. So many people use the ropes or use the ropes during my time because when we go out, when our entrance music hits and we go out to the ring, we want to look big. Everyone at that one moment is staring at you and the cameras are, are on you and there's no better way to get your gimmick or get your character over than standing on the second rope. Now, I do know that Brian Myers mentioned that there was a, a time, a phase when only a select few could, could actually use the ropes during their entrance and I understand what what he was talking about and agree with him. They don't want everybody on the card doing the exact same things on their entrance and they want to save those bigger, those, those, those more elaborate entrances for the Randy Orton's, for the John Cena's, for the bigger name guys. So it's definitely something that never was enforced though they got that right where the part where it was never enforced but i do understand things evolve and you don't want everybody using the exact same entrance and you want to save the really big good entrances for your stars number 18 business casual is required for events now i touched on this one earlier and this is actually one that started during my run and <laughs> To be perfectly honest with you, when it when they came to us with the idea that they wanted us to always be in business casual, none of us thought it was going to going to last. Looks like the joke was on me because 20 some years later, it's still a rule. Men's health, you nailed this one. I agree with you 100 percent. Number 19, no chokeholds. And I'm gonna read this one verbatim. Wrestling value safety. And that's why chokeholds are a no-go. I'll be perfectly honest with you, I'm not familiar with the product nowadays like I was years ago, but chokeholds in my time, I mean, that was almost every match. Maybe they don't do them now. I'm assuming they do. I have no idea where they got this one. Sorry, men's health. Ah, uh, hogwash. Number 20, certain words aren't allowed. There's always certain words that and for whatever reason, they don't want to use. Like they didn't want to use the word hospital. They wanted to use local medical facility or they didn't want to call it wrestling. They wanted to call it sports entertainment. That's that's just always the, the trends and how the, the business is always evolving. And sometimes it evolves forward. Sometimes it evolves backwards. And there's always gonna be trends like that. There's always gonna be words that are accepted and words that are shunned or looked down upon. During my time, it it wasn't many words that they, that they would keep us from saying. But if there were, those were more for the announcing crew and you know, the King and JR had to worry about them way more than we did. Number 21, appearances must be approved. Now, they're not talking about the dress code here. They're actually talking about ring attire and how the WWE takes pride in the appearance of their stars. And actually, they're right about this one. Not saying all attire is approved, but you're definitely not going out onto their program, onto their stage without their approval. During my time, there was a guy backstage who would make a lot of the wrestlers gear. And I would always, anytime he made trunks for me, once I got out of my, my, my black trunk stage, I would always try my trunks on and then make sure, and I would go over and make sure that everything was okay for for the show. Usually it was just me changing the colors of my tights and I never had something not get approved, but I know a lot of guys and girls wore way more elaborate outfits than I did. No, that anytime they were on WWE programming, that outfit was approved by someone backstage before they went out there. Men's health, you actually nailed this one. I'll agree with you 100%. Number 22, no blue pants or shorts on Wednesdays in North Carolina. Gotta be perfectly honest with you, this sounds a little urban mythy to me and I've never heard this. I certainly don't want, I mean, I, North Carolina, I get blue, Tar Heel State, I get that, but you know what? I don't even know where they got this from. In fact, I'm, in, I'm enlisting you. If you know where this one came from, put it in the comments. Educate me. Tell me why they added this one. Number 23, no sneezing. And again, I'm gonna read this verbatim. According to reports, Vince McMahon allegedly hates sneezing. 
Not sure I know anyone who prefers someone sneezing around them. And people will avoid doing it if he can. Okay, I, I don't know if Vince is a germaphobe. Perhaps he is, perhaps he, it's one of his bugaboos, one of his tics, one of the things that he can't stand. And if that's one of the things he can't stand, I guarantee you, if you're around him on the regular, you're gonna do everything to do it away out of his presence. From my experience while I was there, I never heard anything about this. And a lot of times if there was something or if there was a way that you should act around Vince, you know, word would get around. Uh, this was definitely not something that was passed around backstage or not something I ever heard of. So maybe they're right, but from my experience, I can't confirm nor deny. Number 24, no high heels in the ring without a permit. Okay, this one's pretty specific, so again, I'm gonna read it. In a California town named Carmel, high heels aren't allowed in the rings without a permit. I'm enlisting you again. Is that really the rule in the town of Carmel? I can only speak from my time and there was never a time where I heard about any permits in any town or anything being outlawed. I do know as far as high heels in the ring, perhaps it was a safety issue. Perhaps it was they don't want to damage the canvas. They don't want to rip and high heels maybe could rip, you know, rip the canvas, which then later could maybe lead to someone tripping or who knows, maybe someone breaking their leg when they don't perform a baseball slide correctly. But I'm not 100% sure on whether this rule actually exists in Carmel. Walking in the ring is hard enough with wrestling boots on. I can't imagine how difficult it would be in high heels. Next on the list, number 25, photo shoots required. Once you become a, a wrestler, a lot of things change. And one of the things that immediately changes is the desire to have your picture or your likeness. Now, this is something that is actually pretty exciting. I remember the first, first time they pulled me aside for a photo shoot for my very first eight by 10. It was, it was a regular day and I wasn't even in my wrestling gear, but they told me, Maven, go get your gear on, go get exactly what you're going to be wearing to the ring later tonight. And they told me exactly why. You're gonna be taking your first photo shoot. And I admit, I was elated. I was on top of the, just on top of the world because everybody had seen wrestlers eight by tens. I mean, I had seen them for years. I knew exactly, you know, the look I wanted to go for or the look I was hoping to go for. It was just one of the things I could check off that told me I had made it. I was indeed living my dream. So the only time I would think that someone might have an issue with a photo shoot shoot is maybe the company might want a look that you're not comfortable with. Then I'm assuming that the negotiations start. Depends on the, how big of a name you are. Usually I would think the company wins unless you're a big name and you have some leverage. But most of the time I think people are excited to have their photo shoot taken because they know that's a new eight by 10 of them that's going to be out soon. Number 26. No supporting other franchises. They don't want you to put over any other shows. They don't even want you talking about any other shows because even though we are independent contractors, we're working for the WWE and they want us to be loyal. During my time, there was only the one show considering Vince bought WCW and blended both of the organizations. But towards the end of my run, TNA did exist and they they were becoming a little bit more of a household name. And even then it was a no go mentioning them or doing anything them or even thinking of working for them. I know we're independent contractors. We should be able to work for whoever we want, but that's not how Vince and that's not how the WWE saw it. Men's health, you're hundred percent accurate with this one. Number 27, no relationships between full-time and part-time employees. Here they're considering wrestlers being the part-time employees and the full-time employees being the production staff or the crew. I don't know how it is now. During my time, no rule existed that we knew of, although it was probably known that it was just a better idea not to, that there was other people out there and you obviously didn't want to do anything that was going to jeopardize your job, your workplace environment. That said, 
life takes over things do happen and attraction wins out a lot of times so although they probably want this rule to exist it's hard to hard to enforce this rule when two people really want to date so i'm gonna say men's health you're right in the middle on this one probably not wrong probably not right right in the middle number 28 no touching vince mcmahon allegedly wrestlers have been punished for touching McMahon without permission. <laughs> I remember meeting McMahon, I remember meeting Vince, and I remember seeing him backstage, I remember seeing him when he was in a good mood, gregarious. He, I'm not saying he's a hugger, but he's definitely going up to, you know, Taker, Rock, Austin, or whatever, and I, I didn't notice that they were avoiding him. I didn't notice that people were were not getting close to him. And again, just like earlier, I don't know if he's a germaphobe. Maybe he is. Maybe he doesn't like people sneezing or touching him, which if he is, I'm shocked he decided to start a company where he's got people around him all the time. But what this might be referring to is the 2016 incident where Titus O'Neil grabs Vince McMahon. And Vince was, what I heard, not too happy about this. And in fact, it led to a suspension for Titus. So I understand. And maybe, maybe this has been overblown a little bit. But then again, maybe it hasn't been. Maybe Vince doesn't want to be touched. And for anybody going into the, into the business, just stick a hand out, shake his hand if you meet him, and that's it. Don't grab him when he's not expecting it, and definitely don't act like you're leading him in any direction. I understand, he does not like that. Number 29, no political posts. Okay, politics has changed an awful lot since my time. During my time, no one really cared which affiliation you were with, which side you might vote for, so it was never even brought up or asked. And now, unfortunately, people do care. It's one of the things that's changed in the last 20 years, and it's I think it's changed not for the better. So, men's health, I don't know if you're, if you're right on this one. I kind of hope you are, though. And for the last one, number 30, no pronouns allowed. Well, that, that, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> what they're referring to is they, the WWE's a brand, and they want their talent to be branded. So rather than saying he shoots them off and he gives them a clothesline, they want their announcers to use names. They want their names to mean something. So rather than saying he enters the ring, they want John Cena enters the ring. Rather than, you know, he gave a good super kick. They, Shawn Michaels with the super kick. That's all they mean by that. Even during my time, it was the exact same. They wanted guys, they wanted Batista to be bigger than life. They wanted Ric Flair to be the star. They wanted Kane, they wanted Trish Stratus. They wanted those names to come off of people's tongues effortlessly. Why? Because if you say their names and you know their names, rather than using a pronoun, it's going to help the show all together. So, number 30, and for the last one, men's health, you nailed this one, and you got this one right. So, what do I give men's health for their 30 rules that you probably didn't know about the WWE? Actually, I give them a C minus. Why? Some of the things you got right, some of the things you got wrong, and heck, some of the things I didn't even know what the hell you were talking about. But you made me think about some things that I've never even considered or thought about. So, good on your men's health. Now, if you would like to know some things that will actually get you in trouble in the WWE, click this video.